There, all better. So thank you for playing along with that. It's a, I will try to learn all of your names if I haven't already, as soon as I can. But if not, um, if I screw it up, please tell me, especially if I mispronounce it. Um, on that note, my name is spelled differently, but it's pronounced like in the standard Lisa sort of way. Uh, the story that I was told officially by my mother was that when I was born, I looked like a Lisa, but not the regular kind. I have no idea what the regular kind looks like, but I can tell you that I'm happy to have a slightly different name because it's easier for people to find me on the Google and in places like that. So uh, that's my story. I have a little bit about what to expect this semester and then what this class is going to be about. All right, does everybody have slides in front of them? Okay, cool. So, what to expect. First off, I know that this is an advanced class and I know that it's an elective, which means that you chose to be here or someone chose for you to be here, either way. <laughs> and even though it is an advanced class, I do believe that every single one of you is capable. It may, may be easier for some of you than others, particularly those of you who've had exposure to this content before, but as long as you're willing to work, I'm willing to work with you. Um, I have, there's an expression that we use um, in English a lot, if you have a hammer, then everything's a nail. Have you heard that expression before? Everything is a nail, okay? It is. Once you start seeing the idea of nested samples or cross samples, it is really rare in real world data and in research designs that you don't have some kind of nesting or crossing. So I would say that these types of models are more necessary most of the time, particularly in the world of education. So the focus that I have here is this is not a statistics course. This is not a biostat course. We're not going to be proving things. We're not going to be deriving things. I say math is money, but what I really mean is like stata is money. R is money. Because we don't need to know that much math to be able to use the math that other people have developed to make our research better. And so my focus is very much applied. I want you doing these things. I want you to be able to take these skills and apply them to data that are meaningful to you for theses, dissertations, research, and in the real world as part of your future employment. So we're not going to do things that would cause you to be nervous, right? There's no tests. You're not going to have to memorize things. This content does not lend itself to that. There's never going to be a situation in which you need to know this right now or else. Like, we're not emergency room doctors, right? No one's going to code if you can't remember the formula for interclass correlation. That's not how this works. Um, I will also say, as is a new line that I've had to add over the past year, if you find yourself asking ChatGPT for help, stop. That's my job. They pay me. That's what I'm for. So there should not be a situation in which you have to resort to random Googling or AI to find code or answers to things. And quite frankly, AI is not great at really specific technical stuff yet. Um, one of the things that I hope to introduce this year as part of some of the, the, the review activities is providing answers that AI gave to questions about multi-level modeling and have you evaluate the accuracy of those answers. I did this as the last assignment in the spring and the feedback that those folks gave me is that they simultaneously hated it and loved it at the same time. <laughs> Bullshit detection is a very important skill. So I don't care if you try to use ChatGPT. I would just ask yourself, don't, don't, like, it's not necessary. Ask me, okay? Email me. You're not bothering me. I'm literally paid to answer your questions. That is part of my job. Uh, the way that this class is structured, um, I have units of material. They're not tied to a specific number of classes. They're tied to sort of content and, and uh, topics. Each topic is going to have a lecture, and most of them will have an example that follows. And I have the content divided in a way that works for me. I tend to have lecture slides that mostly just talk about like ideas and definitions and concepts. And then I have separate example documents that have annotated syntax and annotated output with questions embedded in it that we go through to actually put those ideas into practice. Um, one of the reasons I do it that way is that so that I can swap out the examples for whatever programs people want to do for workshops or for classes. In this class, um, I'm focusing on Stata and R. Since nobody cares about SAS anymore, except me, <laughs> and you, okay, good. One more SAS lover in the house. Um, SAS is going to be included 
in the materials because everything I have, I start in SAS and then I check my answers against that in Stata and R because then I know for sure that I've got something right. And so inside each example is going to have a download zip folder of the original syntax and the output and I'll have SAS syntax and output in there. I can help you in anything if you have questions about how to use SAS, but we'll be using ProcMixed for most of what we do and ProcLimix for the, the generalized section. So if you're, if you're familiar with how procs work, this is mostly the same. Um, at the end of the course, hopefully we will get to it, the multivariate, oh, another SAS user, excellent, Yen, thank you, thank you for the props there. Um, M plus is another program that I hope to introduce, the world of multi-level structural equation modeling, as it is called. Spoiler alert, it's not actually structural equation modeling necessarily, it might just be multi-level models that are multivariate, where you're predicting more than one outcome at the same time. Um, that's the last unit that I, I have planned, and I have some special topics after that, but, but again, it'll see, it'll just depend on how far we get. Um, I would rather cover fewer topics and do them well than like do everything sort of cursory and make you feel like you only learned, you know, this much about each thing. So I'm going to play it by ear in terms of how long each of these topics takes. Uh, everything's going to be at the course website, which is outside of ICON. So I don't use ICON for much. I use it for um, the readings, so there should be a zip folder inside the files section of ICON that has all of the readings, except for the textbook. Um, I use it for what are known as formative assessments, but everything else is going to be on the course website. And I know the course website looks very antiquated. It looks like <coughs> 1999 called, and that's your web design from it. I don't care, because it's one page, and it has everything, and it's easy for me to update. And so I will have my little box table until I die. Like, that's just how I'm going to roll. I'm okay with it. But every day after class, down here, um, all your materials will be here. I will also post a link to the recording from that day. So uh, what I do is I record the screen share of this monitor. I record my voice and whatever voices are picked up by the microphone. Turn this back this way. And I will have a playlist on YouTube for this class. So you can sign up to be um, a subscriber. Smash that like button and hit subscribe for my channel. <laughs> Seriously. Um, I don't have merch yet, but I do have my own t-shirt um, that says Happy Garbage Day, which I forgot to say, by the way. Um, the story behind that it started during the pandemic when I never left my house. And quite frankly, I don't leave my house that often anymore anyway. But I only could tell like what day it was by whether it was garbage day. If it was garbage day, I had to get downstairs and teach in the afternoons. And if I was teaching in the afternoon and it wasn't garbage day, then I would say, have a good weekend. And so that became like the structure of my week. So it's Tuesday, it's garbage day, and we're back in action. So on the YouTube is where you will find the recordings, point being. Uh, they will be posted here uh, as soon as, usually I put them up right after class. I don't do any editing. Okay, it's literally a faithful replica replication, errors, mistakes, and all of whatever happened during class. And so uh, that makes it so that if you need to review, you can listen to things as many times as you want. All right, and yes, math is money, and these are some of the other reasons why you might want to be here. I will tell you that as a graduate student and as a postdoc and in my early career, I got a lot of papers with my name on them for running the analyses and writing the results section. It's a nice way to round out your publication pipeline to be able to pitch yourself as a methodologist or someone who has methodological skills. And having your names on papers where those skills have been brought to the topic at hand, it gives external validity to yourself pitching yourself as having methodological skills. So that's one thing I like to do is try to play matchmaker. So if you're like interested in, in acquiring those skills, let me know, and if, I find, if people contact me and they want my help with something, I'm like, oh, I know someone who does research in that area that I can try to help connect you. Question? Yeah, so um, when my clinic and research groups do projects, a lot of the times they're consulting biostats people. Um, is there any reason that biostats person couldn't be me? Like, <laughs> not, not as a biostats person, but just you know, to do the analyses. Or does biostats give something that EMS doesn't? Um, okay, I'm going to give my answer, and then I'm going to also invite the epidemiologists and doctor people in the room to answer this question, public health. Um, I think biostat is, it is more, it's closer to stat stat than like quantitative methods or like quantitative psychology. But to a lot of people, that's just a label for somebody who has quantitative skills. 
And I think that biostats tends to work more with the, a medical setting. And so the types of models like survival analysis or other kinds of um, particularly categorical analyses tend to be more common. And so people tend to specialize in things that are more common in those research designs relative to like how I would pitch myself. Mm -hmm. But people have called me a biostatistician, even though I have literally like no stats background officially. Mm -hmm. Um, I have actually gotten reviewer three on grant proposals say that the research team needs a biostatistician. All they have is a psychologist, um, which I take offense at um, because I think that regardless of how, where you're from, you can acquire skills and yeah. those skills can help make your research better no matter what you call yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think you could sell yourself as having biostatistician skills. Sure. The fact that you're picking up a master's degree in educational measurement and stat would help lend some evidence that you have those skills, but being able to put them into papers is probably the most important thing. Okay. So any anyone else want to comment on that? I mean, great answer. Oh, thanks. Yes, and just a side note on that. Yes, yeah, sorry, Zoomers, I forgot this, <coughs> to share the screen, but I'm only on slide two. So I figure that you, you haven't missed too much on that. Um, side note on that. So folks who are interested potentially in picking up a master's degree in our program, you can do that. Um, I am advising, I think, 10 or 11 different people at this point who started taking classes and was like, hey, this, this doesn't suck as much as I thought it would, and I'm actually kind of good at it. And it's 30 hours to pick up a master's degree. In a lot of programs, like HESA requires how many hours of methods already? 18. 18. So you just pick up a couple more classes and you have yet another degree to your name. If that's something that would interest you, please let me know. Um, any of the, I think, 10 faculty in our program would be happy to advise you. And um, it's, it could be just coursework, or it could be 27 hours plus a master's thesis. It, it sort of depends. So just putting that out there as another option for those of you who are interested in, in a, upping your game or getting more money or however you want to talk about it. Yes, technically biostatish, I would say. All right. So we're not doing tests. I'm going to try my hardest not to reference things that are not prerequisite material. So what I need you to have a really good handle on right now is linear models. So standard regression, how to interpret a slope, preferably how to interpret an interaction term, because that's where it gets tricky. And in these models, interaction terms are quite common. Um, this course is going to have a unit that builds off of generalized linear models. So that's a separate course that I teach every spring. Uh, generalized models include things like logistic regression for predicting binary outcomes, ordinal regression or count regression, things like that. Um, there are multi-level versions of those that I would like to get you acquainted with. So if you haven't had that particular coursework, it would be a good idea to review. Um, I've got links to where you can find that stuff someplace. Um, what we are going to do instead of tests in high stakes situations are a couple different types of activities. Those of you who've been with me before will recognize these. One is formative assessments. So these are under quizzes in ICON, but they're not quizzes. They're opportunities for structured review. So there's gonna be six of them worth two points apiece. You get your points if you give it a shot. I don't care if what you write down is not correct. It's an opportunity for you to quiz yourself, basically, do I remember what this concept is or this definition is, or can I give an example of this? And if you can't, then that's a good indication as to where you need to focus in terms of your review. It's also a chance for you to talk to me. So if there's particular things like, I still don't understand this, can we go over this in class? Those types of questions are very useful for me. So what I do is I read over things just to make sure that everyone's done it. I try to make a list as to where there are sort of common sources of confusion or misconception so that we can go over those. So every time one of those is due, the first thing we'll do the next class, assuming I remember, is to go over it. And if I forget, please remind me. But I'm only teaching one class this semester, which will cut down on the interference of, did, it, did this class have a quiz? <laughs> which is where I normally am. Uh, what else we're going to be doing is homework. So we have six homework assignments planned. This is where it does matter if you get them right, but the good news is that you get many, many chances to get them right, as we'll discuss on the next slide. So the first thing that you'll have available, not yet, I'm waiting to get the uh, course reg uh, roster finalized, is a homework zero that is over the syllabus. I will let you know when that's available, but it should take a good 30 seconds of your life to complete it. 
and you get two points of extra credit for doing so. So we're all starting off the semester on a high note. Um, I have six assignments planned. If things start to slow down, I may have to adjust that and drop a homework. I've done that before and I will do it again if I have to. Um, what I'm trying to do though relative to previous years is take the homeworks and cut them up into smaller chunks so that they're less overwhelming. So we might do pieces of homeworks rather than a giant thing. Um, I am planning the option for homework five to let you analyze your own data if you want. There are 23 of you in this class. Some of you have data that you're anxious to use and get practicing with, and some of you don't have data. If you don't have data and you don't think you'll be able to find some, I plan to offer a standard uh, CAN data assignment as an alternative. So you get to think about that um, for the next few weeks, and we'll talk more about the details later, but the idea is to give you some practice doing individual data analyses that I would react to. The reason that it's homework five and not the last one is so that you have a chance to revise your work. Because otherwise, I don't feel like it's useful, right? If I give you feedback and it's like, well, you, you need to fix this, this, and this, I'd like you to actually fix it and get the rest of your points as a learning opportunity. So I plan to try to talk about as many different types of clustered data designs as I can. Education is sort of the obvious one. But if there are combinations that we're not covering as such, please let me know, and I can direct you to other resources that I may have. I've taught a lot of different topics and a lot of different audiences, and so I may have something that would benefit you, even if it's not built directly into this class. Don't be shy in asking. All right, 110. How are we doing? Am I talking too fast? <coughs> not quite? Okay, that means I still get to have more caffeine. Hooray. Cheers, everyone. I should mention, I know this class is over lunchtime. Well, for those of you who aren't old, I eat lunch at 11 because I'm old. Um, but for like the rest of you who are not old and you want to bring your lunch in here, that's totally fine with me. I don't think it's technically allowed, just so don't like spill on the laptops. But if you need to bring food, that's totally fine. All right, so everything is take home, open note, and untimed. Uh, I do accept late work. So if something happens and you can't get something turned in on time, it's fine. However, to try to provide an incentive to make sure that you keep up with the class, I do take points off for late work. So it's two points off for any late homework. No matter how late it is, it's just two points. Same thing with the formative assessment. Since they're worth two points, you can get back one of them if you do it um, at a later point. Uh, I will say, noted here, I will give you an extension if you're planful. So if you're looking at the syllabus and you're like, oh, that's the week I'm going to this conference or that's the week I'll be out of town or whatever, let me know and tell me when a reasonable deadline would be and I'll give it to you. So just the idea is being planful. Um, I know from personal experience, and I imagine a lot of you have this, that things without hard deadlines get pushed off. <laughs> and I don't want to be in that category, which is why I have this here. But you'll note that you get two points extra credit for doing the homework zero over the syllabus, which amounts to one free late homework. Um, I don't do the thing where you drop the lowest grade because I don't think any of it is unimportant and I don't want people to skip work. So that's, that's not what I do. So the formative assessments then, as we discussed, big picture review questions. These are things that you should be able to answer mostly off the top of your head. Uh, I will also include things like case studies, so examples of a research study and maybe some code, and you got to tell me if it's right or wrong, as well as potentially, like I said, AI-generated text that we might discuss the relative accuracy of. Uh, homework, analysis, homework is data analysis. <coughs> so I am expecting you to take the syntax examples that we go through in class, put them in a new file, and start using find and replace to modify them, okay? Find and replace is your friend. I don't expect you to figure out code on your own for anything. I expect you to take the code and adapt it to the problem that you're given in homework, okay? So no Googling. Particularly in R, I have found that going down the Google rabbit hole of how to do this in R can lead to many different places, and some of them are dead ends. So I've tried code before, then I, it's like, oh, well, that worked in R version 3, but it doesn't work in R version 4. I don't want you to have to deal with that. So the code is less important to me. The code is a means to an end, so that's why I want to give you that. Um, the way that it works is, for those of you who haven't seen it before, it's an online homework system. It is a system that um, we developed probably 12 years ago, I think, and you get infinite attempts to answer computational questions correctly. 
So I will give you a data set and a story problem, and I'll ask you a question about the, the data set, like fit a model that does this. And then you'll have questions where the answers are numeric. You input the answer into a box and you hit enter. If you're right, it turns green, and if it's wrong, the box <coughs> outlines in red. You keep trying until it's right. The other part of it is a results section. So it will either be a paragraph that you have to complete where there's drop down menus for decision points. So for instance, if you have a slope, I might have choices of this is a significantly positive slope, non-significantly positive, significantly negative, or non-significantly negative. Results sections really are very formulaic to the point where I can have a computer generate them. They are. So these are templates that I hope you'll be able to use in your future work. Those do not get graded until after the assignment has been turned in and the due date has passed. But once they're graded, you will get a chance to see which answers you have correct and which, what the correct answer should have been. Now, notably, in most cases this semester, but probably not all, each of you will have your very own data set. So that means that what the correct answer is, is individual specific. You can work together on homework if you want to, but each of you will need to complete your very own version. All right, um, yeah, so questions are the most important things. When I was a grad student and a postdoc and in workshops, I was the person with my hand in the air every five seconds asking a question. Be that person. You're not annoying me. It's not interrupting me, I promise. It's much more interesting if we can have back and forth as a group, Zoomers included. I'm still watching the chat window for you. And to talk about how these models apply. So clarifying things like if you get lost in a lecture, you know, five minutes in, the rest of it's gone. You know, you can interrupt and be like, wait a minute, what is this? What did you say that was again? If you have questions like, so I think what you're talking about applies to the situation like this. Can I tell you about it and see if I'm right? Those are great questions. I love application questions. Um, I would prefer if you ask questions in class. That way everyone can hear the answers. But if you're shy, you can email me, you can come to office hours, or you can use the chat window in Zoom and send me a private message. Then you don't have to look silly in front of your peers or anything like that. Um, so we're going to review. Don't be afraid to ask for help if you get stuck. On homework, it is most helpful to me if you send me screenshots. Like, here's what my code looks like, here's what the output looks like, here's what the, the box is, the one that's red. That way I can see exactly what the problem is rather than going through your entire file. In some cases, I might ask for the file to see how you made your variables or things like that, but otherwise, that's usually the most efficient thing we can do. About the readings. So you probably looked at the syllabus and you were like, how many freaking readings did she put on here? I know. I know. But what I use readings for is to provide additional material someone else's perspectives, tutorials, and real-world examples of how these models are used in research. I don't expect you to read everything word for word and have it like in your brain to come to class. I will also note that in terms of the readings, I tend to put them like for the unit. So like I'll have a list of stuff, like this is for unit three, you know, this is for unit four. So it's not like just that day's set of readings. Um, about the textbook, let me see if we can get down here to where it is. So the, the book that I picked is an older book. It's the Snyders and Bosker book, the second edition. Um, it's roughly 35 books on Amazon if you get the paperback, and I'm sure you can find versions of it out on the internet. I didn't look. If you find them, don't tell me. <laughs> I don't want to know. I'm sure you can find them, though. Um, I did some investigation into some more recent options in terms of cluster data specific textbooks. I didn't love them and some were just outright incorrect. So I, I decided to stick with this one. I don't love it, but I don't hate it. So if money is a thing and you're like, yeah, I don't want to spend 35 bucks on this, okay. Um, but I, I do find myself going back to it. It's one of those books where it's like every time I look at it, I get a little more out of it. It's just that it's not as friendly as I would like. I would say it's a little bit on the, on the hard side. But it was what I initially started with when I started learning how to do multi-level modeling, the first edition in 2002, I think it was. So that's why this is not in the icon site. The rest of these readings are. So everything is in a zip folder um, under files and icon for you. All right, 
questions or comments? <clears throat> all right, moving right along. So attendance, thank you all for being here. Let me just leave with that. I don't make any assumptions, right? I know you're all grown-ups and you're all choosing how to allocate your time and you have a lot of competing demands, both professionally and personally, and I appreciate you being here on Zoom or in person, however you want to do it. Um, you don't have to tell me which way you want to attend class. <coughs> Excuse me. If you always want to Zoom, that's fine. If you always want to be here, that's fine. If you want to play it by ear, that's fine too. If you can't be here, okay, I trust you. So I don't take attendance and I don't necessarily assume that everyone's going to be here. If you need to miss, I don't necessarily need to know about it unless it's going to be an extended thing. Now that being said, if I don't ever see you and I look in the homework system and you haven't done anything and I feel like you're ghosting me, then I'm, I may pop into your email and be like, hey, what's up? But otherwise, I'm just going to trust you. So if it works out that you want to be here, great. If it works out that sometimes you can't make it, you can always catch up with the YouTube recording. I do think it's better to be with the class. That way you can get your questions answered right away. That, that makes it, I think, better. Because otherwise, like watching a video where you're lost halfway through, the rest of the video is not going to serve you very well. Um, masks, of course, welcome. This year, I am not in a mask for right now because I know for a fact that I don't have COVID. Do you know how I know that? I just had COVID. Um, I tested negative yesterday after being quarantined in my basement for nine days. So COVID finally caught up with me after three years. So I am good for the moment, but I don't know what's going to happen this winter, and I may throw my mask back on if, uh, if rates go up. You're, of course, welcome to do whatever you want to do. Um, and yes, monkeypox was last year. I'm sure there'll be something new that shows up to, to threaten us all. That's just going to be the way of the world at this point. So yes, everything that we do will be recorded. If the recording gets screwed up or I otherwise um, forget to hit record, which I sometimes do, I will re-record the content and post a separate video. I've had to do that a couple of times. Um, in terms of class schedule changes, if I get COVID again or my kid does, I will probably switch to Zoom. If we have a freak snowstorm or a hurricane tornado or whatever is happening Hurricane, hurricane earthquake tornado thing like they're having in California. Um, if anything like that happens, um, we'll switch to Zoom. So nothing is more important than our health and safety. I will let you know by 9 a.m. if I'm changing the plan to go Zoom only. There are two days on the schedule where I believe this room is going to be taken over by comprehensive exams, in which case we're getting kicked out. And those days are noted on the syllabus and we'll just do Zoom only on those days as well. All right, moving right along, software. So Stata and R are what I've decided to focus on. Of course, SAS, my best friend. Um, my history with these packages, I'll tell you about. One question though that I gotta answer, there's no SPSS and there's not gonna be. I don't hate SPSS. I know like there's a sort of a love-hate thing where some people really like it and other people are like, ugh, SPSS. SPSS does most of what we need it to do with respect to general models. It doesn't have as many options for generalized multi-level models, but I don't hate it. So if you're somebody who's used to SPSS and you like using it, you probably could use it for some things in this class. But the reason that I don't do it is because no one else uses it past that point. So it's not a package that this program endorses, so to speak. Um, I started with SPSS back in undergrad before there was even a Windows to it. It was just syntax at that point. Um, I taught myself SAS during graduate school and postdoc, and I got really, really good at SAS. And then all of a sudden, the world decided to move away from SAS. So I started learning Stata to be able to teach with it. I would describe my skills in Stata as decent, not super great. Um, I'm begrudgingly learning R. I would say my skills are not, we're approaching decent, maybe. And so what that means is that for those of you who are really good at Stata and really good at R, if you have tips for me, like how to do this in less code kinds of things, or if you find that I've done something that isn't correct or otherwise doesn't work for every situation, please tell me. You won't offend me. Um, I don't use the tidyverse in particular. So the examples that I provide use base R as much as possible. We're going to use the Elmer package primarily. 
um, within LME4. Elmer is the function within LME4 within this class. Um, I don't know if we'll, we'll have to do a, a few other things for the generalized unit, but I'm still working on these packages is the point of the story here. So I'm assuming that you know at least one of those. So can I get a hand? State it enthusiasts. A few people are enthusiasts. SAS enthusiasts. A couple. Anybody else did I miss? No one's an enthusiast? Excel enthusiast. No, wait. I was just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> yes, so I'm assuming you know how to do these already. Um, if you need a refresher or you'd like to pick up from scratch learning a brand new program um, in the intermediate class, so 6243, I have videos posted for literally like how to open SAS for the first time, how to open R for the first time, and that kind of thing. So I will direct you to those resources. Um, everything is available on the University of Iowa's virtual desktop for Stata. For R, you can, of course, download it onto your own machine. That's the whole point. R runs really slow inside the virtual desktop, I've found, so I would not recommend that. Um, in terms of what to focus on, um, SAS has a free web-based version, but otherwise you have to pay for it. Stata, you have to pay for. Stata is very popular in certain fields, so if it's like everyone you know works in Stata, you're probably well served to, to get really good at Stata. Um, R is used by everyone but me, so if you take any other EMS classes, you better make friends with R. That's just how it's going to go. What I have against R is the lack of consistency and the lack of quality control. And so I have a hard time dealing with the idiosyncrasies of people's particular packages. And yes, I have seen things that are just completely wrong that come out of it. So for the most part, we're going to work with packages that are sort of well established and that everyone has sort of agreed is good in terms of under the hood, because I do not have the statistical computing background to be able to troubleshoot issues of numeric imprecision or other types of things that would go along with sort of the under the hood part of it. So a um, little bit about what you can and can't do then. Um, so we're going to do Stata and R, which means that I will guarantee in the homework that it works. And in some cases, that may end up being two different versions of the same homework, one with the answers in Stata and one with the answers in R. Because you do get slightly different answers based on whatever algorithms people are using particularly for the generalized versions of these models. Um, M plus, I'm hoping to get to by the end of the semester. It will also be available for free inside the virtual desktop, but it does not have um, REML, residual maximum likelihood estimation, so we won't be able to use it for homework in most cases. Um, just a shout out, so I wrote a textbook on longitudinal models, and the textbook website is called pilesofvariance.com, because that's kind of my shtick when I'm teaching these things. We talk about different variance components and piles. And so that book has a whole bunch of resources in these four programs, and I'm working on adding R to it. So this is some more stuff for you. It's a great book. You should buy it. Oh, thanks. Yeah. You know what? You don't have to buy it. It's in the icon download folder. Because our library lets you open the PDF for free. Seriously. Like, it's, it's unlocked. Like, you just click, and here's the entire book. So I don't get the $2.50 or whatever it works out to be. Still buy it and support me. <laughs> <laughs> I did assign a couple chapters out of the book, but I just put the whole book in the download folder because why not? So, yeah, you, you don't even have to pay for it. Um, so stuff that we're covering this semester then. So I'm assuming that you're familiar with single-level models in a regression framework. So what, what they would have covered in any kind of sort of your first year class in graduate school of regression and ANOVA, general linear models. If you need a review, particularly with respect to interaction terms, here's the link to that class where I have all my videos and all that stuff. And then the generalized class as well. Um, that's going to be later in the semester, so you have some time before that shows up, but this is where I would recommend going for a review if you haven't seen that stuff before. Otherwise, this is what we're going to cover. So the, the class website, the last time I taught this class was four years ago. So it's been quite a while. And at the time, I had to make sure that everybody had sort of a common set of prerequisite content. So the old version of the class, like the first month of the class, was this stuff. Because I had to make sure we were all starting from the same page. Now that I have these resources and that I've seen most of you before and you've been able to take these courses, um, I don't, I'm not doing that this time. But I'll try to throw in a little bit of review as we first get started just to make sure that we are on the same page. So we're starting with general models for two-level nested data, 
then adding the idea of cross-classification. These terms I'll define in just a bit. Generalized for two-level nested, generalized for crossed. Ized, by the way, means not normal. So when you're predicting any kind of outcome besides something that's supposed to be have normal residuals. Uh, an important sort of crossover event with this is that these same models are also known as explanatory item response theory models. So those of you who are focusing on measurements, particularly within the EMS program, may find that unit useful in a different way than you had intended. Um, multivariate MLMs are what we would call multi-level structural equation models if you want to sound fancy. Um, that's for doing things like path analysis and mediation. And then a couple special topics if we can get there. So that's my plan. Ambitious, but I got to start. I have readings for everything, so even if we don't get there, at least you'll have some resources and I can try to point to where I've covered these topics before in other classes as much as I can. There. There. Good. Switching gears then. All right, 1.30. Are we hanging in there? Thumbs up? Yes. Zoomers, I believe there is now like officially a thumbs down button to add to your collection. And thumbs sideways, by the way, is also allowed. That's like, eh. So these are our tools, up, down, sideways. But up so far? How are we feeling? Need to look at the review stuff. Need to look at the review stuff. <laughs> yes, I, it's all here, but I mean, we're going to go back over stuff, right? But the thing that I've, I found is that when people oftentimes struggle with multi-level models, it's not the multi-level part that's hard. It's the linear models aspect. And so that's why I think it's really important that you have a sense of how to work with predictors and models, main effects and interaction terms and that kind of stuff. So there's no golf homework this time, though. <laughs> darn it. You're the only person who's ever said darn I've it. I've done that homework like four times. I know. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a couple of homeworks that are like legendary for people hating them. And one is about golf and the other is about pancakes and crepes. So remember that one? Wow, that, I did that in 2000. You did, yeah. <laughs> yes, J J Jacinta was with us at KU. So she like had that show and now she has this show. So it's, it's, all, it's all a small world after all. All right. So yeah, no, no panic. Maybe a little bit of reviewing on your own, but we'll do it in class as well. All right. So what is this about? Clustered data goes by a lot of different synonyms. Nesting or grouping or classification or hierarchies. Clustered is the term that I'm going to use this semester. The key idea is that these models are useful whenever you have more than one dimension in your sampling plan. So the classic example is I'm interested in student outcomes, but students don't just come to me as independent mutants. Usually students are embedded in work groups, in classrooms, certain teachers, certain schools, certain districts, certain states. Um, in medical settings, you have patients that might all be seen by the same clinic or the same physician who might go to the same hospital, and so forth. Um, organizations, where was the organizations person? Zoom. Oh, on Zoom? There we go, yes. I think that, was that you, Jake? Yep. Yep, okay, good. Yeah, there's your check. I'm watching to see if you're paying attention, Zoomers. I'm still paying attention to you too, hi. <laughs> um, or yeah, employees working within organizations, broadly construed. So that's the type of situation in which these models are designed when we have micro units, as they are called, nested in macro units or, cro or crossed with those. And the idea of multi-level is that each dimension of sampling becomes a level in the analysis. So that means that you can predict why it is that some schools have better outcomes as a function of characteristics about the school. You can predict why some students have better outcomes than other students as a function of characteristics about the students. So any dimension of sampling that has variability across the units that you've collected and you've got predictors that go with that, you can put those predictors in the model simultaneously. So it's like a big like regression lasagna where there's just like these layers going in and everything just kind of gels together. Lasagna being the only thing I know how to cook, by the way. That's it. I don't cook at all, but when I cook, it's lasagna. I got the recipe from Grisanti's, the Italian restaurant that I worked at during college, which was essentially like the Olive Garden, except we had bread loaves instead of sticks. Otherwise, it was the same. So 
I, uh, I waited tables most of the time, but then I needed more hours and I couldn't stand to be waiting tables anymore, so I asked to work in the kitchen. So I started making lasagna and ravioli and fun stuff like that, and I stole their recipe. So, there we go. So, multi-level models then also have a whole slew of synonyms. So, in the stat biostat world, these would probably be known as mixed effects models. It is the same thing. These are synonyms. Uh, the term mixed refers to fixed effects plus random effects. Fixed effects, I guarantee you've seen before. A fixed effect is like a regression intercept parameter or a slope. A, an estimate that applies equally to everyone's predicted outcome. That's a fixed effect. And if you had me for regression, you learned it with that word because I put it in right away because I knew this was coming. Because fixed effects are constants. Random effects, you can also have intercepts and slopes that are random. They're variables. The idea would be that each school can have its own effect of a student characteristic. Each hospital can have its own effect of a patient characteristic. That's the idea of random, and that's what differentiates these models from single level models. Uh, random coefficients models, they're also called. By the way, random effects are latent variables. So anything you learned with respect to latent factors, factor analysis, structural equation models, teaching that in the spring, by the way, that's when that's coming back. Random effects are latent variables. It all translates directly. Uh, HLM is the acronym that is most common for these models, particularly in education, hierarchical linear models. There's also a software package that goes by this name. Um, I don't use it. It's a Windows-based program. Uh, not that that's bad. I just, I, that's not one thing that I do. Um, I can't do everything, right? Like I already have four different packages in most of my classes. I've got to draw the line somewhere. Uh, I will note that this is not the same thing as hierarchical regression. That is not a synonym. That refers to a type of analysis in which you have your predictors entered in sets. Like I'm going to add these control variables and then I'm going to add the stuff I care about and then I'm going to add another layer of stuff. That's hierarchical regression. And most of the time when you see these words, they're talking about what is fundamentally a univariate style of analysis where you have one column in your data set as the outcome and the model is predicting that one column. If you want to predict more than one column at the same time, then you need a multivariate version of the model and that's where you enter the world of what is known as multi-level structural equation modeling. In M+, in Levon, uh, Stata has GSIM that does it, I believe. So it's not as many packages for that, but there are a few. That is also the way that you can best address missing data on predictors. Because the bad news about these models is that they play by the same rules as in regular regression. Every row of your data set has to have all the variables in the model or it gets kicked out. That's still the same. So if you don't want your cases to get kicked out, there's a few extra steps that you have to jump through. And that's where the world of making it multivariate will help because then you can predict the predictor and have missing data on it the same way you can as an elk. That's coming forthcoming though. So examples, I've already beat this to death, but just to add the words that go with it. So we start counting from the bottom. So the lowest level of the hierarchy, for instance, if I'm sampling students within classrooms or teachers, students are level one, classes or teachers are level two. Uh, patients would be level one within doctors at level two and so forth. Uh, three level designs, just since I wanted that, right? Like for this, like students within teachers or classrooms within schools. So you would have a three level design if you have multiple of each kind. So if all of your students and teachers came from, say, Wickham Elementary, where my son will be going for the first time tomorrow, then that would not be a three-level model because there's only one school. So the idea is that you have multiple units of sampling at each of the levels. That's when you need another level. Uh, other examples from other types of research designs here as well. So anything that you have in your head that you're interested in that doesn't exist on this page, Ask a clarifying question. Please. So I recently described something as a with three nested levels, but looking at this, I think I might have done it incorrectly. So I listed it as behavioral data at level one, 
okay. nested within individual participants at level two, nested within the studies they come from at level three. Did I do that correctly, or is it a two level? So, so the question was just repeating for the recording. We have the individual, like, like occasion specific observations. Yep, so it's like longitudinal. The data. Yep. Yep. And then within people. Yep. Individuals. Mm -hmm. And then people are part of different research studies. Correct. Like in a meta analysis. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, meta analysis is a multi level model. Everything <laughs> is a multi level model. Factor analysis is a multi level model. Yes. Do you have more than one study? Do I have more than one? Yeah. Do you have more than one person? Yeah. You win. It's three levels. All right. Yes. So if you have like, um, like census tract level data, like so if I have like a poverty indicator, but at the census tract level, is that a patient characteristic? Does that get assigned to the patient? Do you have multiple tracks of the census in the same data set? Yes. Then that is a uh, track level because it would logically apply to all the people from the same track. Tract or track? I don't know if that's the right word is. Yeah. Can I say chunk? chunk. <laughs> They're census chunks. Yeah. Yeah. If it's if it's multiple people from the same grouping and you have multiple groupings, then that would become a group chunk level variable instead. So you have to know what track they come track they come from. Yes. Okay. Yes, you would. If you don't know, then you then it would be a person variable, but not really. Right. Then then that's a that's a, a sentence in your limitation section. Right. <laughs> Like, ideally, you have to have, you have to know what group people are from to match up the characteristics of the group and the characteristics of the person. So, like, these data sets should have, like, a column for which study is which or which track is which, a column for which person is which, and then a column for any, anything that would be lower than that. Um, on the note of longitudinal, so I teach a whole separate class on longitudinal. That will be coming back a year from now, most likely. Um, and I'm going to try really hard not to talk about longitudinal in this class, but you may hear me slip. Because last year I was all level one is time and level two is person, and this year level one is person and level two is cluster. So if you hear me screw it up, please correct me. But I'm going to try really hard. Uh, the same thing with the subscripts. Like last year it was all TI, this year it's PC. But you may find some I's and T's accidentally in the slide in a few places, so please let me know if I screw that up. So yeah, so these are sort of straightforward cases in terms of sampling, but not everything is nested. So there's also what's known as crossed designs or cross-classified. And that's when people belong to more than one group at the same time, but the groups are distinct in terms of how they're, they're formed and sampled. So classic example in most textbooks, if you know what school a kid goes to and you know what neighborhood they live in, not every student who goes to the same, not every set of students who go to the same school live in the same neighborhood, not every kid who lives in the same neighborhood goes to the same school. So in that situation, you would actually have three different dimensions of sampling, but two of them are two separate level twos. Yeah, so it's like level one and then two level twos that, have, that are uncorrelated with each other. So then you would basically have a model that says <coughs> which student is which, and you can have student level pred uh, predictors, like the effect of what school they go to, school level predictors, and then what neighborhood they live in, neighborhood level predictors. Um, in experimental designs, so Charlotte, I'm guessing you have some of this. Yes, hello, Zoomers. <laughs> uh, if you have subjects that are all responding to the same stimuli or items, and the stimuli and items were created specifically to be manipulated in certain dimensions, and you have a lot of them, then that's also a cross design. Because in order to analyze a response, you have to know from what person it came and what stimuli they were responding to. And those are both two separate crossed level two dimensions where individual responses are, no, are level one. That design is the tie-in to explanatory item response models where people answer the same items across uh, in, a, in a study, or at least some of the same items, uh, to do reliability. So there are a lot of designs in which um, we don't have like an actual observation, like they didn't, it's not self-report, but you might be watching a video or something. And you might, in order to establish reliability of the ratings that the person watching the video is giving, you have multiple people watch the same video. 
So then in order to establish reliability, you have to take into consideration like who the target is that's being rated, who the person giving the rating is, and those are two separate level two dimensions. So these models are useful for inter-rater reliability, particularly when you have multiple raters and multiple subjects and they're not all completely crossed. And also when you have students who change classes. It's kind of funny to me that most of the examples you see in the textbooks are about students nested in classes. And the very first time I was teaching this class, they were like, but what if, like, how do you know which class they're in at a given time? It's like, what? Well, yeah. Kids change classrooms every year, sometimes every semester. So you have to know when they were in that class in order to set up the model correctly and adjust for not just where they are now, but potentially where they've been. Like if you have someone who had a really great kindergarten teacher and everyone in that class learned how to read more than other classes, that benefit may stay with the child as they get measured over time. So this is this type of design, by the way, is the basis of, um, what is the term for it? Oh, goodness. Okay, Chris, I need your help. What is the thing where you're trying to hold teachers accountable and you're using random effects models to do it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Any idea? Value added. Yes. Is that still a thing? Thank goodness. Okay, good. That was a thing for a while where they were using these models to try to estimate teacher-specific contributions to a child's learning and potentially rewarding or penalizing them based on that. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of issues in doing that, but that's, that used to be where these models were good. So glad to hear that's not a thing, at least in Iowa. You can have three level designs that are cross-classified too. So it, gets, it can get even more complicated. Um, there was, there was a design that I helped with uh, once where we had children who were part of a foster care system where some of the children were living with individual families and some of them were living in group homes. And it was the people who were the foster parents or the group like staff who were providing the data about the children. So you really had to know like who the person was providing the responses because there may be some bias based on certain people having certain opinions that would translate into all the people that they've observed. All right, 146. That means class is over. I've gotten better at this over time. When I first started teaching this time slot, they're like, hey, Lisa, class is over, but I caught myself. <laughs> all right, so we'll pick the rest of this up next time. Uh, the next lecture is already posted for Thursday, which we will uh, do after this one. So anything else before we go? All right, then go enjoy the heat or something. And I'll see you Thursday. Thanks for being here. Bye, Zoomers. I'll hang out for a few minutes in case any of you want to talk to me. I do not want to restart. Learn it. It's sticking. Yeah. I think the problem, too, is I just haven't used it like ever. And now I'm like getting chances to use this. Okay, this makes sense. Yeah, using stuff is really like that's the big switch in learning this stuff. Yeah. All right. Very cool.